Welcome back to ECE 320A. It looks like some of you got your days mixed up. It's next Tuesday that we're not here. <laughs> uh, so don't plan on showing up here to class. I might make it back into town, but I didn't want to mess with that logistically. For that reason, the material is on Unit 7 is what I want you to be looking at. That's convolution material and it steps you through. If you want to just jump to the chase, you might look at the introduction and not look so much at the motivation, but there's quite a bit of material there that you can work through, hopefully, or at least watch and look at the notes to try to understand what convolution is. And I want you to be very ready to start jumping into doing the mechanics of in terms of what you will soon learn how to deal with flipping and sliding and intervals and in limits and intervals. And hopefully that will start to make sense and we'll jump into that on Thursday maybe with an example. We might actually get there today as far as convolution or showing a derivation of the convolution integral. That's what we hope to accomplish. In a week is when your homework number six material is due and you really have the background to do that now and so you can do that this weekend if you want and just hold it until a week from today. What I want to do today, we're moving between several different topics. The first is integrating or incorporating initial conditions into the S domain circuit formulation and we've already talked a little bit about that but I want to give that structure explicitly here in this class. We will then talk about transfer functions and once you understand or feel comfortable with transfer functions now you can start playing with just about anything. The system could be a mechanical system, it could be an electromechanical system, it could be a mechanic, an electrical system, it could be a fluid system, a thermal system, it could be a combination of all of those. If you have the transfer function, you have a lot of information and I want you to feel like you now know how to approach those problems and we'll go through a quick overview of transfer functions. Then we will step into convolution and this allows us actually to start looking at what's our output response going to be if we are given some really funny looking input waveform or maybe just a nominal wave input signal and we would like to know what's the system going to do to that? How is the system going to filter it? How will the system respond? Or what will the output look like if we inject this signal as an input into this system and it has this as its output Y? The convolution integral will allow us to determine that information. Let's quickly talk about incorporating the initial conditions into the S domain circuit. We talked about this last time. We have Eli to work with, which is V is equal to L di dt. That's the time domain expression. That's the governing relationship between current and voltage of an inductor. That's what I want you to really know or feel comfortable with. Once you know that time domain relationship, you can now put that into the frequency domain by Laplace transforming that governing relationship. R Laplace transforming that says that the Laplace transform of the voltage, which is V sub L of S, is now L times the Laplace transform of the derivative and the derivatives transform is S times the variable, its Laplace transform, minus the initial condition. And this I sub L of zero minus that's a time domain expression. That's the time domain value. What's the initial current that was flowing in that inductor and you now need to know how have you defined your voltage and current relationships on that inductor. Once you've labeled your inductor in the manner that I've shown, 
then this relationship holds true between the initial condition, the impedance of that inductor, and the current and voltage of that inductor. We now can break that or look at this in two different pieces, or as made up of two different pieces. And I'm trying to just slide through this quickly. Maybe we'll slow down in the capacitor because I've already talked about this, I believe, in last Tuesday's presentation. We have the voltage dropped across that inductor now made up of two pieces. One piece is the impedance. But the other piece is due to the initial condition and we're modeling that initial condition as a series voltage source in this particular configuration. This is one way then to model an inductor if we want to model it or put it into the S domain is with a series combination of the impedance of that inductor which is simply S times L and a voltage source and this polarity minus to plus is consistent with how we've labeled the current coming in from the left going into the positive voltage terminal that we've labeled of our inductor and that voltage drop across the inductor is across both elements. So you have to consider both of those pieces to find the actual voltage across that inductor in the S domain. Is that clear where that's coming from? And you can simply do a KVL if you wanted to. You could say, oh, if I start right here and I go this way to perform a KVL, I have minus V sub L, capital V sub L of S plus S L times I sub L minus L I sub L of zero minus, and I can now rewrite that as V sub L is equal to S L I minus I sub L of L. Is that okay? Depending on what you're doing circuit wise or analysis wise, maybe you are saying, oh gosh, I really want to do nodal analysis in this problem. That's okay and maybe you don't want to do a series circuit combination of your inductor. You can actually make it or put it into a parallel circuit realization by simply solving for the current instead of the voltage. The governing relationship is still the same. If you started with that V sub L equation that we derived from Eli by Laplace transforming, now if we simply isolate the current on the left hand side, the current of that inductor, that's now going to be made up of two terms. Obviously one term is due to the impedance of that inductor. Again, that's just the SL and when we divide that into the voltage, that gives us our current, which would be all the current that we needed to worry about if we didn't have an initial condition. But because we have an initial condition, now we need to put that other piece into play. And the voltage drop is the drop across that parallel combination of current source and impedance. The expression that governs that current source is like what you would have if you had a constant in the time domain and now you Laplace transformed it. That now models the initial condition in this relationship for our current and voltage on the inductor. And you can see, I hope here with KCL at this leftmost node, you have the current in, which is I sub L, equaling the current out, and the current through the top branch is just the in inductor's voltage divided by SL, and the current flowing in the bottom branch is the I sub L of zero over S. And that now is the direction and the labeling that you need to pr provide for an inductor if you want to now include it in let's say a nodal analysis type nodal analysis type problem versus a mesh analysis problem. If you were wanting to do mesh analysis, maybe you would go with the series combination. 
if you say, oh, I really want to write note equations, well, now maybe it's more effective to model your imp or inductor in the S domain using this parallel circuit description. Questions on that? Here is our capacitor coming to us from ICE. And again, once we've established the sign convention on the current and the voltage, that now tells us how we need to keep track of that when we take it into the S domain. And what we want to do now is create these two models similar to how we created those for the inductor. And the process is the same, meaning if we now Laplace transform ICE, we have capital I sub C of S is equal to C, and then we have S times V sub C of S minus V sub C of zero minus or this is now SC times V sub C of S minus C V sub C of zero minus. This one now is written in terms of currents, so let's start then with the parallel S domain representation of this. Meaning if you now are modeling this in the S domain, what we have is we have this current coming in. And it gets split or it's made up of two pieces. One piece is the impedance of that capacitor, which the voltage and the current and I like to simply keep that as 1 over SC. And here is my current. And now I need to just make sure that I keep consistent with the signs that exist in this particular representation. My voltage drop across that capacitor is the entire piece, or it's the voltage across both parallel elements. And what do I need to put in that independent source? Now this particular current source is in opposition to I, capital I sub C of S. And this is now going to be C times V sub C of zero minus. Questions on that? That's now what you would do to replace in the time domain circuit a capacitor if you now want to put it into the frequency domain and potentially do mesh out. I'm sorry, node voltage analysis, you would use this representation. If we wanted to do the other, then we have do what we have done before, and we solve this blue equation that's at the top of the screen right now. We solve that for the capacitor's voltage, and we end up then with the following. We have V sub C of S is equal to 1 over SC times I sub C of S. And now we have this plus... C V sub C divided by S C, the C's cancel and we're left with then this V sub C of zero minus over S. And now we can
deal with this equation. And what do we know about the polarity labeling? If this is now the value of that voltage source, which in the time domain in this model looks like a constant, which way do we label it? So the positive polarity labeling on this source is on the left of that voltage source. And that's consistent with the expression that we derived, and that came from ice. So if you lose your textbook in the next three years and you need to figure out how to analyze this circuit in the S domain, if you just keep track of Eli and ice and how to Laplace transform a derivative, you can derive these models for replacing the time domain circuit model of a capacitor or an inductor with the appropriate parallel or series combination. And which circuit model that you want to use will actually depend on, really it's a personal choice or a personal preference. Meaning if we want to do mesh analysis, then we simply go up and we find those models that contain the series voltage sources. And that keeps everything in the same mesh. If we wanted to do node analysis, we do just the other circuit realization, which is the parallel current source model. Questions on that? And so you can now put this on your crib sheet as sort of a chart, and you could say, okay, here's an inductor. If I want to do mesh analysis, here's my circuit. If I want to do nodal analysis, here's my circuit. On the next line, you have your capacitor, and you can fill in the appropriate squares with the model and the circuit equation or diagrams that you need to make that connection. Questions on that? Let's then move in to transfer functions. Here's the definition. The definition of, let's say, a generic transfer function, capital H of S, is going to be a ratio. It's going to be a ratio of the Laplace transform of the output time response over the Laplace transform of the input waveform or signals time response. And if we labeled the output y of t, then we could say, oh, if you have an equation for capital Y of S, then divide that expression by what we know is capital X of S, or the Laplace transform of our input waveform, and this H of S is what we call our transfer function. Now, what that transfer function actually represents really depends on what we're doing. 
What the transfer function h of s represents depends, obviously, on the input and the output. And what I, maybe one of the take-home messages I want you to leave with today is that if I give you a circuit, that circuit doesn't just have one transfer function associated with it. It could have five. It could have eight different transfer functions. It's just depending on what you define as the input and what you define as the output. Meaning if you say, oh, my input is this voltage source, well, maybe somebody wants to concentrate on the output being the current somewhere in that circuit. Maybe somebody else wants to concentrate on a voltage across a particular element. There's two different transfer functions. Let's then, well, so let me just write that down. Here's the, one of the take-home messages. One circuit, or if you generalize this, if you now are dealing with a mechanical system, maybe you don't have a circuit, but you now have this mechanical system, you can come up with the equations of motion. You can now transform those, and you now have a system, and that system can have several transfer functions associated with it. But, if you have a system, let's just be real hypothetical, suppose that system is an elephant. That's really stretching it, but now you have an elephant. Well, maybe somebody's interested in its leg. Somebody else is interested in its tail. Somebody else is interested in its trunk. But what do you still have? You always have an elephant. So there will be things in these transfer functions, if it's of the same system, that will remain the same. Meaning the dynamic behavior, if you shake that system, it's going to shake a certain way. And it's always going to shake that way. But how you see that shaking may be slightly different depending on whether you're looking at the current or a voltage or some other variable in that particular device. Let's just look at what is possible. Here are some example input and output functions. Let's just make a couple of columns. Here's the input, or inputs, and we might label those as x's, and our outputs as y's. In the input column, uh, well, in this class, we might be thinking about a current source, or maybe we're thinking about a voltage source. But if we were dealing with another system, maybe an electromechanical system, we're interested in a force as an input. Or maybe we are interested in a velocity. Or maybe we are interested in an angle. Or maybe a position, a location. Those are all possible waveforms, x of t's, that could be an input. On the output side, you could be interested in a current flowing through a resistor. You might be interested in the voltage across a capacitor. You might be interested in the force that's getting applied to a particular part in your system. Or maybe you're interested in the acceleration of a mass in that system. Or maybe that mass is velocity. Or maybe this particular device's angle or position. What I want you to keep in mind is that those aren't necessarily lined up. You could now com combine the left-hand column in any way you want with the right-hand column. 
you might have an input that's a velocity and the output is actually a voltage. And that would be a sensor. Now that's, what is that? The input's a velocity and the output's a voltage. Well, maybe you're measuring the speed of a vehicle. The input is the speed, the velocity, and now you see on your dashboard that might be digital because of us, right, the electrical engineers, you now have that velocity converted into a voltage that can now be displayed as a speed on your dashboard because you now have a sensor that converts velocity into speed. I'm sorry, into voltage. Or you could have a voltage in and a voltage out. That's possible. But all of these are potential combinations for transfer functions. Let's look at an example. Suppose I give you the following. Let's say that we have a circuit. Here's V sub G, resistor, inductor, and capacitor. And now if I, maybe we leave the blue V sub G as an input, but maybe we are interested in the series current, or maybe somebody else is interested in the output of that system being your capacitor voltage, meaning the red and the black now indicate two different possible outputs if you consider V sub G as your input in that particular system. How do we put that into the S domain? If you now transform this circuit and put it into the S domain, I'll do the hard part. That's the input. Now, the nice thing about transfer functions is you're worried about the behavior of the system, really just of the system and the input, and you're not so worried about the initial conditions. So if somebody says, find the transfer function between this input and this output, you can basically neglect initial conditions and just try to find the relationship, the transfer function between, let's say, V sub G and V sub C. If that's the case, now our equivalent circuit in the frequency domain has become quite benign relative to what we started with. It looks exactly the same. It's just now we need to replace. There's our resistor. Here's our inductor. And there's our capacitor. What happens when we go from time domain to frequency domain on the resistor? Stays the same. That was a constant. That had a constant relationship. The voltage and current are aligned on a resistor. So those are in phase. What about the inductor? It has an impedance of SL. And our capacitor? 1 over SC. And if we were interested in, in this current, we could label that as capital I sub S, or if we were interested in this voltage drop across the capacitor, then we would be worrying about that particular expression. Let's find some transfer functions. What is the expression for the current? And now, the nice thing about going into the frequency domain is now all we have to do is do some algebra. Granted, the algebra is with complex expressions because our impedances in general are complex quantities. SL, 1 over SC, or R's. But now that we have this, this would be essentially like three resistors in series. It's just these resistors are just now complex in behavior. 
But that S variable allows us to account for that. That's why we like to play with S's. That's why we like the Laplace, because now we can just do algebra instead of differential equations. If I now want to find the expression for I, I say, well, okay, that's just the current through everything in that series circuit. I have the voltage that's forcing that. That's capital V sub G of S divided by the total impedance. And the impedance is just the sum of those three impedances. Question? So now it doesn't really matter. The question I think was, if my circuit is more complicated than what I've shown here, what happens? Well, as long as you do your time domain to frequency domain relationship or conversion properly, the circuit's going to basically look structurally the same, especially if you're dealing with the transfer function. But now, instead of worrying about, oh, let's see, what's the... KVL in the time domain, well now you can just write KVL like you would do with resistors except whenever you come up on an inductor you have SL for its impedance and that gets scaled by I. You have a capacitor, that's 1 over SC. Oh, that's just a fancier resistor, that's just a generalized resistor is the way I like for you to think about it. If that's the case, then we have, did that help answer your question? So here is our source, and we can find the total impedance in that series circuit by just adding up all three impedance values. And obviously, we may not want ratios of ratios, we may just want a ratio of polynomials, a polynomial in the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator. We may not want a ratio of terms in the denominator, so we may want to clean this up, but let's see what happens as we go. Suppose now somebody says, oh, I want a transfer function, H1 of S, and I want my output in that transfer function to be I of S, and I want my input to be V sub G. That's how we defined the transfer function, as the output divided by the input. If we now replace this with what we know, now V sub G over, and this is has an argument of S, this is now R plus SL plus 1 over SC, all over V sub G of S. The other way to do this is actually just to play with the algebra in the red equation and simply solve for I over V, and you'll get exactly the same thing. I'm just being very explicit with how we've defined it. Hopefully in this formulation you can see that the VGs cancel. If the VGs cancel, now we end up with H sub 1 of S, being this 1 over R plus SL plus 1 over SC, which if we want just a numerator polynomial over a denominator polynomial, then we may want to put everything in the denominator over SC and then multiply by 1, which is SC over SC, which magically pushes that SC in the numerator, and we end up with SC over... S squared LC plus SRC plus 1. I've rearranged the terms a little bit to allow my denominator polynomial to be written from highest power of S down to the lowest. But all I have done is placed this original denominator over the common denominator SC and now I have 1 over something over SC. The SC can be moved up, and now that's my transfer function between the input voltage, V sub G of S, and the current in that circuit, I of S. And we now, now know how to attack that. Given an R, an L, and a C, 
we can find the poles of that transfer function. And the poles tell us something, actually it tells us quite a bit about that circuit's behavior. If I said, oh, the poles are now real, one's at minus one and one's at minus six, what kind of a response are you going to see if I kick it? And kicking it is the impulse. So I kick it. Better be careful or I will kick the jam my toe. Make for a never mind. <clears throat> Wait until I jump up on the desk. Make sure it's stable. Better not. So what am I going to see if I now hit that system? Two exponentials, aren't I? One with an e to the minus t and another one with e to the minus 6t. I think that's where I put my poles. Minus 1 and minus 6. You now know how that system is naturally going to want to shake or move. If I now said, oh, I picked r, l, and c such that the denominator has roots at minus 1 plus and minus j2, now I shake it, and what happens? Now I excite that system with an impulse, and what happens? It's a damped, exponentially damped sinusoid, isn't it? So now, if, if we had this particular structure, if we, I mean, what I was talking about there, I wasn't worrying about the numerator at that point, but if I was just worrying about the denominator, all we know is we could have sines and cosines that are exponentially damped. The damping would be e to the minus 1t, the sine or cosine frequency, I think I said my poles were at minus 1 plus and minus j2, the frequency is 2 radians per second. And that's how that system would move if it, we just excited it. Questions on that? That's one transfer function for that circuit. But we've also indicated another one that we might be interested in. Suppose we are interested in another transfer function. H sub 2 of s, which is v sub c of s over v sub g of s. Well, we've already found the current, so why don't we just find v sub c in terms of the current? If we know what the current is up here, v sub c is not that hard, it's just the impedance times that current. And the impedance of that particular element, which is the capacitor, is 1 over sc, and so now we have 1 over sc times i of s. But that's simply, now if I remember what I of S was, and now if I multiply the denominator by SC, it's going to basically do what I had done before, but it's no longer going to end up popping that SC up top. Does that make sense? If I now multiply the denominator in the I of S expression by SC, I end up with S squared LC plus SRC plus 1, and up here I still have my V sub G of S, and that's V sub C of S. Which now allows me to find this ratio which now I simply am canceling what's the V sub G in the numerator, and I end up with a transfer function, H sub 2, of S squared LC plus SRC plus 1. And that's another transfer function. Somewhere in this lecture, I think I talked about an elephant being an elephant. 
whatever that meant. <clears throat> but in this case, in this example, here's the second transfer function that we identified. Can you see any similarity of that transfer function with this transfer function? The bottoms are the same. It's still an elephant. The bottom is what governs the natural behavior of your system. The bottom is your characteristic polynomial. That's your characteristic equation. That's the polynomial that determines the poles of your system. And that, we have an elephant is an elephant. If we have a circuit, then what we can realize is that the characteristic polynomial which in this case is s squared lc plus src plus 1 is equal to the denominator polynomial and that is the same in H1 of S and H sub 2 of S. And if I found the voltage across the inductor, what do you think its denominator is going to look like? It's going to be the same. If I looked at the denominator polynomial of the voltage on the resistor, it's going to be the same. So now if I kick that system, it naturally wants to behave as an e to the minus t and an e to the minus 6t, for example. Now how we see that depends on what we're looking at, whether it's resistor voltage, inductor voltage, capacitor voltage, or the current in the waveform or in the system. Let's just summarize some of the properties that we can now identify with transfer functions. One is if we have a linear so now we have linear oatmeal lumped. Oh, you don't want lumpy oatmeal, do you? But what's a lumped parameter? What does that mean? That means that the frequency that we are interested in is in such a way that we don't have to worry about the resistance being distributed across, let's say, the entire circuit. We can just lump it into a particular one value of R and call it 100 ohms. We don't have to worry that it's distributed across the scale. So now our wavelength of the system is much longer than the circuit elements that we're dealing with. So the linear lumped parameter circuits yield rational transfer functions. That's this ratio of polynomials in S. That's the rational. We have ratios of polynomials in S. That's what happens when we have these linear circuits that we're typically modeling in this class. If we have a transfer function or transfer functions, we can actually obtain those or those are obtained under zero initial conditions. When do we need to include the initial conditions when we're doing a circuit problem? 
Maybe we want to see the complete solution due to some excitation. Then we want to incorporate the initial condition in our circuit that we have been analyzing. But if somebody says, give me the transfer function, and once you have that transfer function, now let me experiment and see what kind of response that system has to all sorts of different inputs. Once you have the transfer function, you don't have to rederive that circuit problem for each new input. You can now say, oh, now that I know my transfer function, all I have to do is worry about the new input. I don't have to reanalyze the circuit or the system for each new input. We also know that the poles of our transfer function, poles of H of S, govern the natural response or the transient response of the system. Suppose I have these poles at minus 1 and minus 6. Now you could tell me what the structure of my natural response looks like. Just by given that being... What's the structure of my natural response? I have some amount of the first mode, the minus one mode, and I have some amount of the second mode. And that's my natural response. That's what my system would do if I excited it. Now, how long would I see that response? How long would I have to quit worrying about watching that response? Or when would it finally be finished if I simply hit it with an impulse. So now I have five time constants. And which, why, how many time constants do I have in this circuit, or in this system, in this example? I have two, don't I? I have two poles, and they're real, so they each one have their own time constant. The time constant, may, let's talk about this one first, because the other one it might confuse us, because it's so, it's, too easy. What's the time constant associated with the second pole? You look at this exponent and you say, okay, the time constant is the value of time when this guy becomes 1. So what value of t is needed for that exponent to become 1? Well, tau is now 1 6. That has a time constant of 1 6. What about the first one? That one's the easy one or the hard one, depending on your perspective. Now you're saying, when is t equal to 1? When it's 1. So now we have this guy having a time, a time constant of 1 sixth, this one having a time constant of 1. Which one do we worry about? If we're worried about how long this is going to be happening, we look at the slowest one, the pole closest to the origin the s equal minus 1 pole. That says we have a time constant of 1. We take 5 of those. Oh, after 5 seconds, we can basically quit watching. It's not going to be interesting anymore. Does that make sense? All of that by looking at the transfer function, looking at the denominator, we have now this characteristic polynomial, or the denominator polynomial, and we find its roots look at the real parts of those roots to determine the time constants or how quickly those things are decaying. Which we've just been playing with. We've been playing with the fact that the denominator polynomial
equals the characteristic polynomial. Meaning that denominator tells us basically what that system is, whether it's an elephant, a cheetah, a monkey. We look at the denominator and that's what tells us what we have. All right. What else do we know about transfer functions? If somebody now gives you a transfer function, you can actually determine whether or not that system, if somebody excites it, if it's going to be stable, meaning it's going to be well behaved, all the oscillations will damp out and be gone after a certain amount of time. Is your system stable? Well, a stable system has all of its poles where in the S-plane? We want their real parts to be negative. So now if we're looking at this S-plane, we want to look to the left of the vertical axis. We want all of the poles of your system, which are the roots of your denominator polynomial, for your system to be stable, all of those poles are in the left half S-plane, which we typically abbreviate as LHP. That just helps us when we're texting. We can just say LHP. Is your system stable? Yes, all the poles are in the LHP. Right? This, this was defined just recently after we started texting. No, this LHP has been around for a long time. But what do we know? Now you're on a job interview, and somebody goes, oh, here is a passive network or circuit. Passive means we don't have to energize any of the elements in that system, and we don't have to energize R, L's, and C's to make them function. So we have a passive R, L, C network or circuit. What kind of transfer functions do these produce, R, L, C circuits? Stable or unstable, or both? Passive RLC networks. And the thing that's saving us is this R. It's damping things out, isn't it? It's introducing damping. That's pushing our poles into the left half plane, that resistor or those resistors. If we simply have a passive RLC circuit and you've now done the analysis and you find the roots of your denominator polynomial, if they aren't in the left half plane, You've done something wrong algebraically, unless somebody's given you some minus R's, some R's that are negative. And that actually requires an active device. We don't have passive resistors that are negative in value. So passive RLC networks produce stable transfer functions. One more property. The zeros of H of S, and what are those? Do the zeros influence our time? Res I'm sorry, do they? influence the time constant of our system, the zeros? What are they, first of all? The zeros of H of S, how do we find those? If somebody gives you a transfer function, how are you going to find the zeros? Those are the roots of our numerator polynomial. And now let me give you something that you can go home and impress your 
friends with. If you have a transfer function with this description is what you can impress your friends with, the finite zeros, by that I mean the values of s that cause, the finite values of s that cause the numerator to vanish, those are the finite zeros. If the finite zeros of a stable, so now that automatically tells us where our poles are located, of a stable h of s, now we know all of our poles are in the left half plane. If the finite zeros are also in the left half plane, We give those systems a special name, they're special, and we call them minimum phase. And those actually are the systems that we will look at or examine when we're sketching Bode plots. We want to sketch Bode plots for minimum phase systems. That means all of our X's and O's are in the left half plane. That's what that means. All of our X's and O's are in the left half plane. Questions on that? Yes? The question was, why is it called minimum phase? And I didn't tell you, did I? That will, be, that will make more sense when we start looking at our poles and zeros and their response to sinusoidal inputs. But essentially, if we look at the Bode plot, we could have a magnitude response from one circuit that looks exactly like the magnitude response of another circuit, but some of the zeros in one circuit could be in the right half plane and some of the zeros in the other circuit are all in the left half plane. The one that has all of its zeros in the left half plane, its phase is minimum. <laughs> And that will make more sense. If we start sketching the phase response in the Bode plot, its phase will not be as big. And you really want things that don't have a lot of phase shift. The more phase shift, the more delay in your system. And that's typically not a good thing if you're trying to control or keep track of something. So I danced around the answer to that, but we'll get back to that in a few lectures. The other thing that I could, well here, I know that didn't satisfy you, that explanation. So here's our S plane. And what we are going to learn, let me put my minimum phase system zeros here in red, and now let me put for another system, it has the same red poles, but it's zero is just in the opposite location. It's a mirror image of that red zero. Now, we are going to learn how to find the frequency response of a system. And one way that we do that is we build the circus tent, right? We create the circus tent, we put these infinite poles in place, and now we tack it down with thumbtacks at these zeros. And then we walk underneath the circus tent along the imaginary axis, and that height of that circus tent is our magnitude response. What we will find is if we looked at the magnitude response at a particular location, now somebody says, oh, I'm interested how the system is going to respond right here, at let's say j omega, let's say j omega x. If I now look at this, that zero is going to contribute the magnitude of the distance between that zero and that point. And the angle of that zero is theta sub z. Well, if we look at this, and now isn't it 
nice that you took your geometry class. If I could sketch this properly, what's the length of that hypotenuse in both cases? It's the same, isn't it? The vertical distance is the same, and I claimed that they were the same distance away from the vertical axis. So they have the same legs, and so the hypotenuse is the same, but now what's the angle? Well, the angles are always measured with the horizontal positive horizontal line. Now, which angle is minimum? The one in the left. This is the minimum phase system. This will give us, if I had the red zero and these two red poles, it would give us a magnitude response that looks the same as the red configuration but the phase angle will be different. And the one with the red is the minimum phase system. Pardon? So now if you have more than one zero, which you can, all you want to know if you have a minimum phase system is they all are in the left half plane. So if you have all of your zeros, and they could be complex, they could be real. They don't have to always be real. You can have complex zeros. And what are we going to learn? You, you thought tic-tac-toe was fun. Now we're going to draw this S-plane, and we can place these poles and zeros to design things. We can design filters by placing these poles and zeros. Where do we place them? We'll now say, oh, what's the bandwidth? That will define our circle. And now do we want a Butterworth response? That tells us how they are positioned on that circle, etc. Pretty exciting stuff. So that's where we're headed. Butterworth, oh, and here. What do we know about Butterworth filters? Or what do you think of when you hear Butterworth? Syrup. And, and okay, so now you have Mrs. Butterworth. This is how it was actually defined. I, I'm sure you thought that. Now if you have a Butterworth filter, and it's a low-pass filter, the magnitude response is like a pancake. What do you know about a pancake? It's flat, isn't it? Flat as a pancake. So your Butterworth magnitude response is maximally flat. So if somebody says, oh, you have a Butterworth filter? Oh, I know the magnitude response is maximally flat because I remember the syrup analogy and pancakes. Eh, that's not how it became to be defined, but it makes for a good story. Well, I guess that's up to interpretation also. Any, qu any other questions on syrup, elephants, monkeys? Now you can go home and you can impress your friends and Oh yeah, I have an electrical and computer engineering class. What did you talk about? Elephants and syrup and pancakes. <laughs> but you now can tell them a story, can't you? You can start drawing poles and zeros and start explaining that, oh, all of this is related to electrical and computer engineering. I can now create a sensor that measures a velocity and converts that into a voltage and maybe I need to filter that sensor because I don't like this high frequency noise so I need a Butterworth low pass filter to, sensor, or to filter that sensor signal. Alright, now let's keep going. Uh, now I need to come up with something else that's more exciting than an elephant eating pancakes with but Mrs. Butterworth's syrup. Let's motivate convolution. Here's given information. Suppose now somebody gives you the following circuit. And this they label as X and here's Y. Now, for your in-class participation, Find the transfer function and tell me what that circuit is.
And don't take too long, because I'm hungry now after talking about pancakes, syrup, elephants. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? You're going to have a capstone project if you haven't already done it, and it might look very challenging, as big as an elephant. But you can still solve it by just eating that elephant one bite at a time. This class cannot end soon enough, is what you're thinking. Yes? What was the question? I got confused on the elephants and the pancakes. Find the transfer function between x and y. Is that what I ask? Pardon? So you tell me. Hopefully, this is what I'm, I'm now, this is a quiz for me. This is my quiz. Now I look and see how well did they do. If they mess this up, then I go, I failed. I got a 10 out of 100 on this lecture. So please, get it right. What's the transfer function between x and y? So the input is x, the output is y, and now you have to remember what does that mean relative to the transfer function. All right, judging from the chatter, we're finished. Yes? No? All right, put that aside, make sure and hand it in. But what we want to do is, if we have that transfer function, what we are going to learn is that we can actually find the impulse response of our system. 
What does that mean? That means in the time domain, if we hit this circuit with an impulse, we could now measure at y of t what the impulse response is going to be. But once you have the transfer function in the s domain, in the frequency domain, to find the impulse response, all you have to do is inverse Laplace transform h of s. So the impulse response, h of t, is going to be the inverse Laplace transform of capital H of s. That's the impulse response of this system. Once we have the impulse response, then we can answer questions, as many questions as you want. For example, suppose somebody says, oh, I want you to apply to that system the following signal, x1 of t. And somebody says, okay, find y of t. What's the output when we introduce? And what is this? This is just a finite duration pulse. If we wanted to write it in terms of signals that you are familiar with, what does this look like? This is simply u of t, and then we turn that u of t off after t1. This is a pulse. And now, if we wanted to, we could actually find the step response and then subtract from that step response the step response, a delayed step response of T1. And that would give us the Y of T. But we want to start to understand, based on what we see as the impulse response, what's that going to do to this particular waveform? If we go back and I'm not answering this question very directly. What is this? That's a low-pass filter. Did everybody get that? Did you see that? As soon as you saw that, that's what I want you to be thinking. Low-pass filter, low-pass filter, an RC circuit, low-pass filter. Now you just have to show that in equations or find the H of S. But if you now know that, if this is now a low-pass filter and somebody injects into that system this pulse, what would you expect to see at the output Y of T? If you now low-pass filter this waveform, what are you going to see? And what's your answer? It depends. Right? I didn't define the bandwidth of that low-pass filter, did I? If my low-pass filter is very wide bandwidth, if I pass a lot of frequencies, if that low-pass filter is really wide, then what would you expect the output to look like if we injected this into the system? About the same signal. But what do we know? This is supposed to be flat, but this is in the time domain, so we can't talk about Butterworth. Butterworth's in the frequency domain. Just making sure you're keeping track of your pancakes. But this is now, this is a flat, but that corner, ooh, that makes a lot of high frequency content. So probably when we low pass filter, we're going to round that edge a little bit, but if we have a really long or wide low-pass filter in terms of its bandwidth, we're going to see coming out of that circuit about the same thing that we put in. And if we looked at the impulse response of that low-pass filter that had a wide bandwidth, what would it look like? it's going to look like this exponential decay, but it's going to have a very high initial amplitude and it's going to be very rapid. So if you looked at that relative to this ideal impulse function, the wider the bandwidth of your low-pass filter, the higher that peak and the sharper its decay, it looks more and more like an ideal impulse function. So the more your system looks like an impulse function ideal, the more the input signal is going to look like the output signal. 
Does that make sense? If you had a really narrow bandwidth for your low pass filter, this out the output of your system from this input is going to be pretty distorted. It might look, depending on the frequencies, but now if somebody said, oh, put this through your system. Now this one's fairly low pass maybe in behavior to begin with. And this one might come out of the system, but it again depends on the bandwidth of your low pass filter. We'll have to pick up at that point on a week from today. Next Tuesday, please look at the Unit 7 material in D2L on convolution. It should pick up from this point. Make sure I get your in-class participation.